this mean for the ordinary American? Well, it's really interesting, Richard, because one of the things that Trump is doing, uh, you mentioned some of his advisors. He has, um, I would say, recycled a lot of people from uh, the Ronald Reagan days, the Reagan Revolution. Some of the people around him, uh, uh, David Malpass, Stephen Moore, Larry Kudlow, Art Laffer, Judy Sheldon, and others. These were all veterans of the Reagan Revolution. Now, you know, they were in their 30s and maybe early 40s then, and now they're in their 60s and 70s. That's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But they're running the Reagan playbook. The Reagan playbook was lower taxes, less regulation, more spending. Ronald Reagan was not a fiscal conservative. He ran up a lot of debt. He was a big spender. He took the, the U.S. GDP ratio from 35%, which is pretty low, the debt to GDP ratio, that is, from 35%, which is pretty low, to 55%, which is pretty high. So Trump's trying to do the same thing. So lower taxes, less regulation, more spending. The problem is we are in a completely different world. When Reagan did it, he had nothing but tailwinds. Interest rates were 20% when Reagan came in. They had nowhere to go but down. Inflation was 15% and had nowhere to go but down, and we didn't have that much debt. Today, interest rates are close to zero. They have nowhere to go but up. Inflation is low. It has nowhere to go but up. And most importantly, our debt to our GDP in the United States is 104%. Reagan came in with 35% debt. Trump has got 105% debt. A lot of scholars think the, the danger zone, you know, Angela Merkel would say 60%. Uh, Ken Rogoff, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, economists would say 90%. Well, we're at 104%. We're in the danger zone already. So Trump's going to run this playbook, but he's going to find he's in the Premier League now instead of the, you know, the, uh, the second league. Uh, he's, he's got major headwinds. This is not going to work the same way. It's not going to, it's not going to work out the way it did for Reagan. And Jim, any fair and rational analysis of his tax plan? And I'm certainly not Jim Rickards, but I've been covering economics and finance for a number of years. And I had a good, long, hard look at what he put out there when he was campaigning. And then I looked at what the congressional Republicans want to do. And either way you look at it, the little guy is going to get screwed. And it's going to be, you know, wonderful tax breaks for the very, very, very wealthy. That's a fair, a very simple and a very, you know, um, you know maybe unscientific analysis. But that's a fair analysis, isn't it? Well, that's right. There's almost no way around it. Uh, half the people in the United States do not pay any income tax. Uh, you know, for better or worse, you can debate the policy, but they just their their income is such that we don't tax very much uh, income tax at the lower levels. Of course, you get into the higher brackets, you pay a lot of taxes. So, if you're going to cut tax rates, almost by definition, it's going to help the the richest people. Now, one of uh, Trump's advisors is a guy named Art Laffer, an economist. I know Art very well. Um, and he, he's the inventor of something called the Laffer Curve, uh, named after himself. And the Laffer Curve says you can cut tax rates and actually collect more revenue because you'll get more growth, uh, people sell assets, uh, you know, you'll get more activity. And so the revenue you get from the added activity makes up for the tax cuts. Uh, so that's the theory. The problem is there's almost no evidence to support the theory. It might be true at 100%. If you had 100% tax rates, nobody would work, right? So cut them a little bit, you get a little bit of work. But nobody really knows the shape of the Laffer curve. The evidence that it works uh, in the environment we're in today is, is non-existent. So you're going to cut rates, you're going to get less revenue. So the wealthy will get a benefit from the lower tax rates. The economy will not get that much of a boost. We're eight years into an expansion. It's one thing at the early stage of an expansion, you do something like that, you might get a little more growth, you might get some bang for the buck. This this expansion is eight years old. Now, it's been punk. I mean, it's been a very weak expansion. I'll grant that, not not as not much growth as we need, but you're not going to get much bang for the buck. So this kind of looks like uh, just a benefit for the rich in the sense that they get lower rates. You're not going to make it up in revenue because the, the Laffer curve doesn't work, work the way the theory says, and you're not even going to get that much growth because – we're eight years into this. We don't have that much spare capacity. So a lot of this doesn't add up. If you want to help the working man, cut the Social Security tax. The Social Security tax is a flat rate. Everybody pays it. I said before that not everybody pays income tax, and that's true in the United States. But everybody does pay the Social Security tax. That's a flat rate. If you really want to help people in lower incomes, you cut that tax. But I don't see that on the table. That's not part of these proposals. No, no. I'm going to mention again road to ruin dot London. That's where you can uh, get Jim's book, uh, The Road to Ruin. Now, um, sometimes we come across people who talk about finance and they make statements. And we don't invite them on programs like this because their statements are sensational and they are not backed up by, by fact. It's like the headline, not supported by the text. That is not the case um, with uh, Jim Rickards. He wouldn't be on otherwise. Jim, what is the financial elite's uh, ICE 9 plan. What is that? How do they plan to basically stop people using uh, and spending their own money? This is 
deadly serious stuff. How how are they doing that? Well, first of all, thank you, Richie. By, by the way, I, I don't make any claims that are not backed up. My book, The Road to Ruin, has 151 endnotes. Now, fortunately, they're at the back. You don't have to read them if you, if you don't want to. But if you want to read them, if you want to explore the sources and the original documents, it's all there. So as I say, you can, you can debate the sources, but the, the claims are all backed up. Now, ICE-9 uh, is a concept I talk about in the book. Uh, it's borrowed from Kurt Vonnegut, the author. He wrote a novel in the early 60s, 1960s, called Cat's Cradle. And it, the plot involved a uh, sort of a mad scientist who invented this new molecule he called ice nine. And it's just like water except for two things. Number one, the melting point is 114 degrees Fahrenheit, which means it's frozen at room temperature. The second thing is that when ice nine comes in contact with a regular molecule of water, it turns the water into ice nine. So in other words, it freezes. So the plot of the book was, you know, he kept in these vials and gave it to his kids. And if the children opened the vials and poured it into a stream, the stream, the river, the oceans, all the water on Earth would freeze, the planet would freeze, and life on Earth would die. So it was a kind of a doomsday machine. I've taken that story, great, great story, by the way, and I brought it in as a metaphor to describe what's going to happen in the financial markets in the next financial crisis. And I talk about two other crises, 1998 and 2008. Now, in both of those panics, 1998, there was a global financial panic. They printed the money and gave you your money back. In 2008, global financial panic. Again, central banks printed trillions of dollars. People were able to get some liquidity. In the next crisis, it's going to be bigger than the central banks. The central banks are not going to be able to bail it out because this crisis will be bigger than their capacity to do so. So where is the liquidity going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the International Monetary Fund with this world money they have. It's a funny name. It's called the Special Drawing Right or SDR. But that's going to take three or six or eight months to actually do. You've got to go all the countries in the world together. They've got to agree, come up with a plan. That's going to take a while to do. In the meantime, there's going to be a financial panic. It's going to be bigger than the central banks. It's going to take six months or longer for the IMF to ride to the rescue. They're going to lock down the system. They're going to freeze the system. Money market funds will not give you your money back. Banks will be closed. ATMs will be reprogrammed. Maybe they'll give you, say, 300 pounds a day for gas and groceries, maybe less, but they'll say, why do you need more than that? So you've got, you know, 50,000 pounds in the bank. They'll say, sorry, you can only have, you know, 300 pounds a day for gas and groceries. We'll get back to you about the rest. Banks will be closed. Exchanges will be closed. A couple of things. First of all, this has all happened before. Everything I just described has happened. You know, in 1933, uh, President Roosevelt closed every bank in America. 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Uh, as recently as 2015, ATMs and banks were taken offline in Greece. By the way, Richie, this is happening in India today. I finished uh, this book, The Road to Ruin. I finished writing it um, in early September. And, you know, it takes a couple months to bind it and put it in boxes and ship it out to the bookstores and all that. I could see all this was coming. I didn't know it would be here when the book came out. But yeah. it's in India today. They've, they've actually – imagine waking up tomorrow morning and Prime Minister May has said – uh, all uh, ten, five, ten, and twenty-pound notes are illegal. They're no longer le legal tender. That's what happened in India. Prime Minister Modi woke up and said the one thousand rupee note and the five hundred rupee note are illegal. They are no longer money. Uh, by the way, a thousand rupees is is about uh, about fifteen, twenty pounds, so it's it's comparable. So uh, so they said, well, what you can do it's illegal. You can't spend it, but you can bring it down to the bank and deposit it. We'll give you digital credit in your account. Oh, by the way, the tax man was waiting at the counter. If you walked in with a large pile of notes, say, well, here, here are my old notes. I'd like to get these digital credits. They'll say, well, where did you get the money? So the tax inspectors are there. This dissuaded a lot of people from going down. Those who did got digital money. They didn't get paper money. And then, of course, that means they can freeze it or impose negative interest rates. They did come up with a new 2,000 rupee note. You could exchange it. Guess what? This shows how idiotic this was. The new paper money they printed was the wrong size. It didn't fit in the ATMs. They had to go around and close every ATM in India and you know, re refit them so they could dispense these new notes. It's been a disaster. There have been money riots. People have been standing in line for days to do this exchange. Meanwhile, this is the most idiotic thing of all, Richie. It's a cash-based economy. It would be one thing if you did this in the U.S. or the U.K. I mean, you know, 80% of our transactions probably are digital, you know, debit cards, credit cards, direct pay, Apple, you know, iPhone, the rest. But India is actually a cash-based economy. Fishermen could not buy fuel uh, and bait for their boats, they, so they couldn't bring in a cash. Farmers could not get fuel for their uh, trucks, so they couldn't bring their their crops into town. The whole economy was shutting down. This is what happens. Sorry to interrupt you. Can I throw a wacky theory in there, which you, sure. which you can shoot down? Do you think, and I'm just going to tweet out that India story, which happened around about November 9th or 10th, if I remember. 8th or 9th or 10th. We, we mentioned it. Uh, briefly on the program and the way we mentioned it was we said well we wonder 
if that was an experiment in some way to see to gauge the reaction of people because I think when you were first on we talked very briefly about the cashless society agenda because yeah. ultimately these same elites Jim they, they want they want rid of cash don't they well that's absolutely right we're seeing it in other countries you're exactly right Richie first of all um, about a year ago the European Central Bank banned the 500 euro note there used to be a 500 euro note that's now illegal going forward so the biggest one is a 200 euro note in the US uh, Larry Summers a professor at Harvard Ken Rogoff another professor at Harvard uh, Summers wants to ban the $100 bill uh, Rogoff wants to get rid of cash completely Sweden is well down the road to a cashless society more and more merchants are saying we don't take cash even if it's legal we don't take it by the way um, I'm sure it's similar in the UK uh, Americans think they can go get their cash out of the bank don't even try it you go up and ask for you know two or three thousand dollars not a you know particularly huge amount of money they'll call the manager over the teller's face will turn white they'll file a report uh, with what we call the financial crimes enforcement network that report will go into a file somewhere between Osama bin Laden and Pablo Escobar. I mean, you're treated like a criminal. A perfectly honest citizen will treat you like a terrorist, a drug dealer, or a tax evader. For asking for your own money, cash. Jim. For saying, I for want your, my own money. For your own money, exactly right. So there's a global war on cash. Now, I also said, Richie, I don't, don't recall if we said it on the show the last time, but it's in my book. The war on cash leads very quickly to the war on gold because gold is an alternative. So if you're making money impossible to get, you know, I said, if you want to slaughter cattle, first thing you have to do is round them up into a pen. So if the elites want to slaughter savers, they have to round them up into these digital pens, the big banks, digital accounts, no paper, cashless society. Round everybody up, and then you can slaughter them with negative interest rates, confiscation, taxes, account freezes, etc. So, well, cash is an alternative to that, but they're making cash illegal or extremely difficult to get. But you can still get gold. It's I'm talking about physical gold, not paper gold. Physical gold, whether it's you know coins, uh, sovereigns, or our American gold eagles, or, or other other forms, you can put those in a safe place, not in the banking system, by the way, because the, the day you most want your gold is the day the banks are going to be closed. So that's what we call conditional correlation. Those two things will happen together. You'll want your gold to be banging on the door of the bank. They won't let you in. But there are non-banks, uh, places I'm not, uh, not an endorsement, but I know Sharps Pixley down at uh, German Street in London, and there are other places around the UK, reputable dealers, private vaults, you can store it safely. But but the elites are going to wake up to this. They're going to say, hey, we, we boxed everybody in. We, we made it impossible to get cash. We put them into these digital uh, slaughterhouses so we can take their money digitally. But people have gone to gold. Well, guess what they're doing in India right now? I just read this this morning. The tax police are breaking down doors and they're seizing gold, physical gold, just taking it. You know, As you know, an Indian bride, that's her dowry. Uh, if you had too much of it, they seem to think you're a criminal and they're taking that. So the war on gold is right behind the war on cash. My advice, get your gold now while you still can. This is an amazing stuff, uh, by the way. Folks, then we've got Jim Rickards on uh, the line. We're talking about uh, his brand new book, The Road to Ruin. Uh, we've tweeted out uh, road to ruin dot. Um, let me just... Uh, Make double sure of that now. Yes, I have put the right one out. There. Road to Ruin dot London. That's where you can get the book for free, folks. Okay, the secret plan for the next financial crisis. Jim, uh, the tweets are flying in. Uh, they are flying in. Is it fair to say that the these financial crises, crises plural, um, are all connected, and that what happened in uh, two thousand and eight again was an experiment and was the pretext for what's going to happen next? Well, they are definitely connected in the same way that uh, you'll see earthquakes in the same place over and over. And that's not just a metaphor, Richie. I mean, it's a, you know, maybe an interesting metaphor, but this, the dynamics, the, the systemic dynamics, the math and the physics are exactly the same. So if I'm standing in Florida and you say to me, Jim, when's the next earthquake? I'll say, probably never. Florida's not seismically active. There are no fault lines in Florida. You don't get earthquakes in Florida. But if we're standing out in the San Andreas Fault in the California desert, or in Sumatra, um, that I'll say it could happen any minute. It could be the biggest earthquake you've ever seen. So we we have these indications. We know they're coming. The financial system is no different. It's a complex dynamic system. It's capable of collapse at any time. Now here's the difference. If an earthquake starts, you can't stop it. An, an earthquake is a release of energy. That's what an earthquake is. That's how they're defined. Uh, you can't stop it. But imagine if you could. Imagine a thought experiment. You could stop an earthquake in the middle of its activity. What would happen? All that would happen is the energy would be stored up. It would be waiting for the next time. It wouldn't be released, and the next earthquake would be worse. That's what happens in a financial panic. The difference between a natural system and a man-made system is you actually can stop it in the middle. And the central banks have done that by freezing accounts, printing money, bailing out banks. They've stopped the earthquake, but they didn't solve the problem. They just bottled up this unreleased energy. That's why 
Each crisis gets bigger than the one before. Each bailout gets bigger than the one before. And my point is the next one coming soon is going to be bigger than the central banks. They're going to have to go to this world money from the IMF. They're going to have to lock down the system. They're going to have to seize depositor money, yeah, wipe yeah. out equity. It's going to be bad. And, the, and of course, these, uh, the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, ultimately then that agenda is to, to take the real wealth wealth that was traditionally historically owned by the people of any country. So sovereignty is gone, uh, Jim. Are we seeing, do you think we're seeing in Europe with recent elections, with the European Union referendum in the United Kingdom, do you think we're seeing a bit of a rebellion against that, against that agenda? Well, we definitely are. We saw it in Brexit. We saw it in the election of Donald Trump. We've seen it in the rejection of the Italian memora- the Italian uh, referendum on the constitutional change. That means Italy is going to have to have new elections soon and probably get more votes for the Five Star Movement, which is a, a nationalist, uh, you know, call it Trump or Brexit style movement. But here's what here's what worries me: the global elites haven't gone away. They're losing these elections and they're losing ground. Um, the, you know, nationalism is coming back, globalism is fading, but the global elite's agenda hasn't changed. They're still there. So what can they do? Well, one thing they do is just they wait it out. You know, they never go away. Maybe one person dies and some protege takes his place. One of the they train these new elites. They're self-selecting, self-perpetuating. So they never quite go away, and they're very patient. Sometimes it's ten years between these shocks. But the other thing they use, and I talk about this in my book, The Road to Ruin, is called the shock doctrine. And the shock doctrine is if I have a really unpopular agenda, I have something that I know the voters are going to reject, but I cause a panic, I cause a shock of some kind, and I come along and say, hey, I've got the solution. People are so fearful, they buy into a solution that they wouldn't normally buy into because they're afraid. And that's how they advance the agenda. So one of the things that concerns me is, you know, particularly with regard to Trump, because he is pres- he will be president of the United States, do the elites look at him, you know, uh, ripping up the, the climate change uh, uh, agenda, ripping up the trade um, deals, etc., um, and then say, you know what, why don't we trash the system and discredit him? What you've described there um, is brilliant, and it's what we've called, or it's what David Icke has called problem, reaction, solution. Mm-hmm. It's magnificent, create a problem, you know the reaction that's coming from the public, and you've got the ready-made solution that they would have previously, as you said, this is brilliant stuff, road to ruin dark London. Jim Rickard, here's the story, Jim. Um... And I want to come back to the book, and there's a load of questions about silver and gold that I want to put to you from our audience. Here's the question that's relevant to you. In the monologue today, um, I spoke about and played a clip of an interview conducted by Adam Bolton of Sky News. He's one of their political anchors. And he spoke to Alan Moses. Now, Alan Moses, you might or might not know, Jimmy, probably do know, uh, he's the chairman of the Independent Press Standards Organisation, otherwise known as IPSO in the UK, Talk about Orwellian, Jim. Talk about Aldous Huxley. What did this guy, Alan Moses, say today? I'll tell you what he said. He said, people depend on accurate information, and they base that on judgments they make, and they base it on, they base that information, and they use it to make decisions when they go to vote on election day. Do you know what he said, Jim, Alan Moses? He said, we need to start regulating information. You know what that means, Jim? That means guys like you. Well, uh, absolutely. And uh, how, how, how a, terrifying is that? We need to regulate information. Well, it just means that, uh, you know, the, the uh, one of the um, the trends uh, right now on Twitter, at least in the United States, is hashtag we don't need you. And this is a reference to the press. The press are kind of the last to know. You know, they've had a monopoly on information. So in our case, you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, a few of the other networks, maybe in the UK, it's the BBC and some other channels. Um, but they've had a monopoly on information. But now because of social media, because of shows like yours, candidly, uh, books like mine, uh, I'm active on Twitter, you are as well, um, and many, many others, uh, and you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the different channels, we can communicate with each other. Donald Trump is the king of uh, Twitter. He's actually pretty good at Twitter. You know, Twitter, as you know, is challenging because it, the, the messages are so short. You have to think about what you're going to say and be a little pithy and be, a, be succinct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, everyone, not everyone's good at it. Trump is very good at it, and he's using Twitter to call out – um, you know, excessive contracts by military contractors, conflicts of interest, et cetera. So the, so the New York Times and the Washington Post are sitting there saying, hey, what about us? Of course, they're attacking him every day, but fewer and fewer people care. They've lost their credibility. They've lost their soapbox. They've lost their megaphone. Now, that's where we are right now. But now comes the pushback. And they, that would be, okay, so they get these uh, tech billionaires, the people, you know, Zuckerberg and uh, people who run Twitter and others, and say, well, you need to edit this and they label it they call it hate speech nobody likes hate speech hate, hate speech is repugnant but they'll take a, a, a dissenting point of view 
and call it hate speech just as a way to get it off the air. So by branding things incorrectly, uh, they can exercise this kind of censorship. Um, they can put pressure on the big publishers. They can put pressure on the networks. You know, I've done a lot of uh, interviews on something called a channel called RT, uh, and uh, sometimes I get criticized. They say, well, don't you know that RT is controlled by Vladimir Putin? I say, I know that. I say what I want anyway. I don't yeah, want yeah, anyone yeah, to censor yeah. me. But the point is NBC is controlled by the White House. I don't see any difference between perhaps Putin's influence on RT and the White House influence on our NBC because NBC is part of a big corporation called Comcast, they want to do acquisitions. They're subject to review by the Justice Department and Antitrust Division. And so you want to put muscle, you want to use muscle uh, on NBC, just tell them they're not going to approve their next acquisition. So that's how the world works. And uh, we, we sort of have this political pressure anyway, but it could get worse. It's amazing you talked there about hate speech and the way they're trying to use that. You know, they take some examples of some awful things that people say, and then they, they try to use that to discredit anybody. That's challenging that's right. the system. I mean, there's there's a guy um, was was tweeting some very hateful things about an MP, uh, a, an English member of Parliament, um, who happens to uh, have a Jewish background. Now, the guy is a world class moron. You know, he right. was tweeting a picture of her with a rat's face and really nasty stuff, horrible stuff. You know, but laws exist to deal with that already. So what Twitter should do: shut the guy down, get rid of him, kick him off there, and maybe somebody should go and knock on his door and say, "Hey, listen, you be careful now." But jailing right. the guy. And then saying that anybody who talks about the crimes of um, the state of Israel or anybody who talks about, you know, um, anything like that, well, they're all crazy, they're all lumped in like that. It's very dangerous. And what Alan Moses is recommending, the regulation, regulation of information, they're not really going after the racists, and there are plenty of racists, and the anti-Semites, and there are plenty of them. They're going after credible people, Jim. I'm certainly not trying to, you know, in any way um, um, wind you up or, or, or make you annoyed, but it's people like you. Simple as that. Oh, and, and who's going to determine whether what Jim Rickard says in the Road to Ruin book, who's going to determine um, the efficacy, efficacy of that, the, 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 um, the, the, the truth of what's in the book or not? Who gets to make that decision? These are scary well, times. That, that's right. One, maybe uh, one advantage I have, Richie, is I write about economics. Look, I have, I have political opinions like everybody else, but who cares, right? My opinions are mine. Everyone's got this. But I don't really write about politics. I write about economics. So I think yeah. maybe there's a sense that, well, that's a little geekier. That's a little harder to follow. Although my, uh, my books are so well, partly because I, I don't dumb it down. I write at a very high level, but I use plain English. I use metaphors. I tell stories. I make it very accessible to the reader. So I'm kind of dealing at a Ph.D. level but at an accessible level that anybody can pick it up. And one of the nicest compliments I ever got on my, my first book, Currency Wars, uh, it's about 300 pages. Somebody read it, and they said to me, Jim, I read the whole book cover to cover, 300 pages. I had no idea if you were a Republican or a Democrat. And I said, thank you very much. I said, that's a nice compliment because I, that's how I wrote it. I wasn't getting on a political soapbox. I was trying to explain uh, what's wrong with the central bankers, what's wrong with risk management, why the system is unstable, and do it, as I say, in a very accessible way. So maybe because I, I keep, I'm not afraid of politics, I have my opinions, but that's not really what I write about, so maybe I'm not as much of a, a target. Maybe not, but of course what you say has a direct impact on, on these very people, these elites that, um, that you're calling out in the book, Jim. It's brilliant. Th th lots of tweets on this from people saying, um, this is fascinating stuff. We don't have the money to hoard gold and silver. What, 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 what does Jim say to us? What are we going to do? Imagine, Jim, imagine a scenario. Somebody's got... Um, they've managed to save over 20 years of working life. They've managed to save a thousand pounds sterling a year. They've got 20 grand in the bank. Let's say they have 40 grand in the bank. Uh, that's okay. savings. And, and maybe they've got a building society account where they're putting some money away for their pension. What do they do, Jim? Okay, so let's say you've got uh, 40,000 pounds in the bank, and that's your, your lifetime savings. You work very hard 30, 40 years to get it. Take 10% of that, right? So that would be 4,000 pounds. And um, so um, just trying to. Do the math. So you could buy, for example, you could buy four ounces of gold for that. That's enough to get four ounces of gold. You and I don't recommend more than ten percent. Don't go all in. But so for if you have forty thousand pounds in the bank, you could take four thousand pounds. You could buy four ounces of pure gold. Put it in a safe place. Don't put it in a bank safe deposit box. Hopefully nothing bad happens. Hopefully I'm just wrong and and these things don't come to pass. But I obviously wouldn't be talking about them if I if I thought I was wrong. I can see this coming. And so when it happens, if they do close the bank, you'll have your four ounces of gold, you'll be protected, your wealth will be preserved. So even people of modest means can can do this. Um, even if you had 10,000 pounds, take 1,000 pounds and go buy one ounce of gold. Put it in the same place, that'll preserve your wealth. People are really worried about keeping money in banks more than ever. 
and right. you're very, very, very definite about saying to people, look, don't put any more money in any bank account before you take a look at the information that you've put out to him, in, not only in this book, The Road to Ruin, but in other books as well. And we get questions, and, and I never answer them because I'm not qualified to answer them. I always refer people to the guests that have come on, people like you, people like Nomi Prins and, and others have been on this programme. People are terrified of banks, but they don't believe banks. For example, you will know that the United Kingdom, the government has said here that banks must guarantee deposits up to £100,000. But, but people don't believe that, Jim. They don't, they don't right. believe it. They're, they're like, well, why should we believe that? And if this crash comes then, why should we believe that we will have our £100,000 if we want it? They're, you think they're right not to believe it, okay? Right. Uh, no, look. If you have uh, if you have a million pounds or five million pounds, I mean, you're kind of stuck. You can't. Uh, you can buy a certain amount of gold. Again, I recommend ten percent. Um, if you have a hundred thousand pounds, the first thing I would do, uh, again, I would use my ten percent rule. I would take ten thousand pounds. Go out. That's enough to buy maybe. Um, uh, that's enough to buy a uh, thousand uh, ounces of gold. Uh, sorry, not a thousand ounces. That that would be uh, so ten thousand pounds. So you could buy uh, ten ounces of gold. So if I had um, so if I had a hundred um, hundred thousand pounds. I would take ten thousand pounds out, um, and I would buy, um, you know, I would buy gold with that and put it in a safe place. So now you hope the banks, you hope the banking system doesn't crash. You hope your account's not frozen. But if it is, you've got your gold outside the system. And what's going to happen to the price of gold in that scenario? When they shut down the banks, the price of gold is going to skyrocket. Now I'm not saying it's going to go up a lot tomorrow. It might go down a little bit tomorrow. But in the panic, when that comes. The price of gold is going to skyrocket, and that's going to preserve your wealth. One way I think about it, Richie, it's kind of like fire insurance on your house. Nobody wants this house to burn down. But heaven forbid if it does, you're sure glad you have the insurance. And so that's one way to think about it. It's You, you don't want a financial panic to happen, but if it does and they shut the banks, having that physical gold off to the side will preserve your wealth. Do you envisage a time in, in, in your life, you and I are both young men, do you envisage a time, Jim, when the the full... I, I don't know, the full story, the true story of what fractional reserve banking is will be understood by people. You know, the legendary Ford quote about if people knew how money worked, if people knew how the economy worked, there'd be a revolution. Because when we first spoke, we mentioned this, a lot of what's going on comes down to the fact that banks get to print money out of thin air, create the principal, don't create the interest, so we're condemned to be forever in debt to these institutions. Well, this is what I talk about in my book, and even people who are critical of that. First of all, here's the thing, Richie. Most of the people who understand what you just said are sort of part of part of the system. They work for the IMF. They work for the banks. They work for the Bank of England or, in our case, the Federal Reserve. So they have no interest in blowing the whistle on the scam because they're part of it. Okay, now there is a, a, there is a smaller group who do understand it, who are critical of it, who want to help people understand it. But they tend to be a little bit geeky, like uh, Mar Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard is a great... Um, Austrian economist. He's written quite a few books. I read his books. He does explain this, but even he is somewhat technical, and you need a little technical training to understand it. So who's out there, not part of the system, willing to be critical, but kind of speaking in plain English to everyday readers to explain this? Well, there aren't that many. You actually mentioned one of them. Uh, my friend Nomi Prince is one. I try to do it myself in my books. Um, there are a few others, but but not that many. You sort of have to seek them out. But the number of people who are trying to explain this to everyday readers in plain English without a lot of uh, you know, technical talk. There just aren't that many. We've had a tweet from David Stewart Cole, uh, basically parroting that, uh, Jim. He's read your books and um, uh, praises them. He said, um, the road to ruin will be worth it because I've read uh, Jim's others, really good books, well written and well explained. And that's the key to talking about finance because I found over the years presenting programs, and you'll know, Jim, you've been on every television uh, every major network in the States, RT and everywhere else, people switch off. And it's to their detriment. They don't understand how important it is. The language that you use and the way you come across is so hugely important. Uh, there's no um, doubt about that. Folks, it's uh, Road to Ruin London. Uh, that's where you can get your uh, free copy of The Road to Ruin. Jim Records is on the line. It's 20 minutes to the top of the hour. Jim's going to stay with us for another 10 minutes or so. Keep those tweets uh, coming in, by the way. Um, this, this, it couldn't be more vital. Jim, we mentioned this last time. I'm so glad you're back on because people are asking me questions that maybe, maybe people didn't hear you the first time you were on. What sort of timeline do you have in, in your mind? I know it's difficult to tie people down to you know, exact predictions of exact days and, and months, but when do you think this is really going to go absolutely nuts? 
Well, here, here's the thing, Richie. In my book, I talk about 2018. But the reason I did that is there was a panic. We were just hours away, just hours away from closing every stock and bond market in the world. And September 28, 1998, I have a whole chapter on that in my book, The Road to Ruin. That was the Russia long-term capital management crisis. The reason I know that, I negotiated that bailout. I was in the room with the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and the big banks. I actually did that deal. I know how close we came to complete catastrophe. Come forward 10 years to 2008, we were days away from the sequential collapse of every major bank in the world. So Bear Stearns had failed in March 2008. Our big mortgage agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, failed in uh, June 2008. Lehman Brothers failed in September 2008. Morgan Stanley was just a couple days away, then Goldman, then Citibank. All of them would have collapsed. Uh, again, the Fed intervened, truncated that process. Uh, it didn't come to the worst, but it was extremely close. So we've come within you know, hours or at most days from collapsing the entire system twice uh, in a 10-year span, 1998 to 2008. So all I do, I come out 10 more years just to keep that 10-year tempo. 2008, I talk about this third crisis, and we talked about it on the show already with uh, with ICE-9 and the freezes yeah. and special drawing rights and all that. But here's my point. It could be 2018, but it could be tomorrow. In other words, don't wait. Don't. Uh, by the way, when this happens, it will happen very quickly. It will start out slowly, but no one will kind of notice to go, oh, you know, by the way, good example, um, the, the panic of 2008 when Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt September 15, 2008. That actually started in the spring of 2007. Uh, some of the mortgage losses started to show up. Uh, then there were some hedge funds that failed and some money market funds that closed in the summer of 2007. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, Bear Stearns so that, in March of 2008. So that took a year to play out. Same thing happened in uh, 1998. That actually started in 1997, June 97, in Thailand. And then it spread to Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, Russia, and then finally, uh, long-term capital management blew, blew up. So the lesson, there are two lessons. Number one, these things start out in small ways. It can take a, a year to sort of spread around the world, but nobody sees it coming. You, these things are happening. It's like, oh, it's only Indonesia. Who cares? It's only Malaysia. Who cares? But they don't know that these are like dominoes falling, and you're the last domino, and it's heading your way. So that's the first thing to understand. But the second thing is when you get to the acute stage, so the height of the panic, September 2000, uh, sorry, 2008, for example, or September uh, 1998, uh, it's too late, and things are happening very quickly. And people go, "Oh well, you know, call me the day before, and I'll sell my stocks and go get some gold." I'm not going to know the day before. I can see it coming. I can see these things unfolding. You may not be able to get the gold. You know, if the price of gold is skyrocketing, and you you wake up and say, "Oh, well, gee, I better you know get some cash and get some gold," you might not be able to get it. You know, the dealers will be sold out. The mints will be back order back ordered. The big guys will get it. You know, central banks will get it, and the, the big hedge fund billionaires. But everyday people, you you won't be able to get it. You'll be watching TV. You'll be watching the price skyrocket on TV and you won't be able to get any. It won't matter to you. So my, my advice is, what are you waiting for? Do it now. Loads of tweets. Just Jim tweets that he disagrees with the buying of gold. Evidence tells us in the lowest of times people trade goods and services, not precious metals. Uh, he says, just to have a, a conflicting opinion there. Uh, Faisal tweets, under the bed is safer than a bank these days. He agrees uh, with you uh, loud and clear uh, there, Jim. And I suppose something that's been on my mind all day, people need to realise that many of the criminals, many of the banksters, who were responsible for, you know, insider trading, derivative trading, all the financial crimes that were committed pre-2008, none of these people went to prison. They're still there, aren't they, Jim? They're still in the Correct. system. You know, we, we have a, we passed legislation in the United States. It was called Dodd-Frank after uh, Senator Chris Dodd and Congressman Barney Frank. Uh, it was over a thousand pages, a thousand page bill. It hasn't done any good, by the way. It's, it's sort of uh, papered over uh, all the problems, but it's not going to work in the next dress test. But all you had to do was put Jamie Dimon on a chain gang, put one high profile banker in prison. That would have done more good to, to um, clean up their act, stop the fraud, uh, be more prudent, stop taking excessive risk. Stop placing heads I win, tells you lose bets. Putting just a couple, maybe even just one high-profile banker in jail for these crimes would have done more good than a thousand pages of legislation. There's so many, you know, we've had so many discussions, Jim, about some of the crimes of these institutions. You know, in the Republic of Ireland, how um, hedge funds were able to buy up mortgages. And the poor, miserable men and women who took out mortgages from Allied Irish Bank and the Bank of Ireland, they didn't know that their mortgage had been sold um, for pennies on the pound by the bank to these hedge funds. They had no idea this happened. And, right. and then, to make matters worse then, um, the, the, obviously these hedge funds came looking for these properties. 
There was nobody there to protect these people whatsoever. And the criminal banks, after getting rid of the mortgages, they went and made insurance claims on the mortgages going bad. I mean, Jim, and, and, and to your absolute credit, and I, and I was so excited when we contacted you a few weeks back to get you on the programme the first time. You're one of the few people historically, when you look back, and this is the wonderful thing about the internet, the wonderful thing about, you know, a digital footprint. You know, I was able to see that. You'd be more than people about this. You'd been telling people about it. None of these people ever went to prison, not to just labour that point. You know, what they've done to people. Uh, you know, we've talked about that agenda to keep everybody renting, Jim. You know, to stop people owning their own property. They don't want people to have, you know, wealth, tangible wealth, real wealth. This is what these people are doing. I'm going to, again, plug Road to London. Excuse me, Road to Ruin Dart London. Road to Ruin Dart London. Get your free copy of uh, The Road to Ruin by uh, Jim Rickards. Jim, do you think people, because of what you're doing, and because you were able to present this information in a sexier way, maybe, than it has been presented before, do you think people are finally starting to grasp it, to get a grip of it? I think they are. You know, it's very uh, gratifying. Uh, I was, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm in New York City for this, uh, for this show, Richie, and I was uh, down on Wall Street this morning, and I'm up in my office in Midtown right now. So I check the subway. I ride, ride the underground all the time. And I uh, was standing on the platform. A fellow just came up to me, uh, perfectly nice, introduced himself. He said he was an artist. He said, I'm not an economist. I'm an artist, but I read your books. Um, I've got, he gave me his card uh, from, from his gallery. He said, I've got some money in gold. I've got some cash. I'm building an A-frame. And I looked at him, I said, and he said some kind words about my book. I said, thank you very much. Uh, and I said, uh, hang on to the gold, and it uh, sounds like you're good to go. So it is, uh, it is rewarding and gratifying when just, you know, people stop you on the street and thank you for writing the book. So I'm very, very grateful and appreciative to that. But it, it tells me that the message is, uh, is getting through. It is. It definitely is. We can see that in the response that we get when we cover the economy and finance on the program. Again, I mentioned earlier, Jim, when I started out in commercial radio, and I was actually producing a senior presenter we used to dread doing stories about finance in the economy partly because we weren't telling people the truth you know we were giving people the FTSE um, 100 or the Financial Times version of the story but we used to be very conscious of the fact that it was switch off radio people wouldn't be interested in it they wouldn't get it they wouldn't understand it it's vitally important that guys like you using the language you use and that's not to suggest people are stupid they are not you know, people are far brighter uh, than me um, who don't understand what a derivative is. They don't understand what a bear market is. They don't have any idea. But Jesus, do they need to know more than ever, right? Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things, you just say derivative. People go, oh, what's that? Yeah. Some people know, but a lot of people don't. But if I said to you, you know, it's a side bet, right? So there's, there's a horse race, and we can go to the track and bet. But what if we want to sit in our homes and just make a bet between ourselves, right? That's all a derivative is. It, it's a... It's a bet on something else. So it's, it's a derivative of something else. So you have the stock market going up and down. But over here, you and I can make a side bet. I can say, Richie, your stocks go up. You know. What do this mean for the ordinary American? Well, it's really interesting, Richie, because one of the things that Trump is doing, uh, you mentioned some of his advisors. He has... Um, I would say recycled a lot of people from uh, the Ronald Reagan days, the Reagan Revolution. Some of the people around him, uh, uh, David Malpass, Stephen Moore, Larry Kudlow, Art Laffer, Judy Sheldon, and others. These were all veterans of the Reagan Revolution. Now, you know, they were in their 30s and maybe early 40s then, and now they're in their 60s and 70s. That's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But they're running the Reagan playbook. The Reagan playbook was lower taxes, less regulation more spending. Ronald Reagan was not a fiscal conservative. He ran up a lot of debt. He was a big spender. He took the, the U.S. GDP ratio from 35%, which is pretty low, the debt to GDP ratio, that is, from 35%, which is pretty low, to 55%, which is pretty high. So Trump's trying to do the same thing. So lower taxes, less regulation, more spending. The problem is we are in a completely different world. When Reagan did it, he had nothing but tailwinds. Interest rates were 20% when Reagan came in. They had nowhere to go but down. Inflation was 15% and had nowhere to go but down, and we didn't have that much debt. Today, interest rates are close to zero. They have nowhere to go but up. Inflation is low. It has nowhere to go but up. And most importantly, our debt to our GDP in the United States is 104%. Reagan came in with 35% debt. 
Trump has got 105 percent debt. A lot of scholars think the, the danger zone, you know, Angela Merkel would say 60 percent. Uh, Ken Rogoff, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, economists would say 90 percent. Well, we're at 104 percent. We're in the danger zone already. So Trump's going to run this playbook, but he's going to find he's in the Premier League now instead of the, you know, the, uh, the second league. Uh, he's, he's got major headwinds. This is not going to work the same way. It's not going to it's not going to work out the way it did for Reagan. And Jim, any fair and rational analysis of his tax plan, and I'm certainly not Jim Rickards, but I've been covering economics and finance for a number of years, and I had a good long hard look at what he put out there when he was campaigning. And then I looked at what the congressional Republicans want to do, and either way you look at it, the little guy is going to get screwed, and it's going to be, you know, wonderful tax breaks for the very, very, very wealthy. That's a fair, a very simple and a very... You know, um, you know, maybe unscientific analysis, but that's a fair analysis, isn't it? Well, that's right. There's almost no way around it. Uh, half the people in the United States do not pay any income tax. Uh, you know, for better or worse, you can debate the policy, but they just their their income is such that we don't tax very much uh, income tax at the lower levels. Of course, you get into the higher brackets, you pay a lot of taxes. So, if you're going to cut tax rates, almost by definition, it's going to help the the richest people. Now, one of uh, Trump's advisors is a guy named Art Laffer, an economist. I know Art very well. Um, and he, he's the inventor of something called the Laffer Curve, uh, named after himself. And the Laffer Curve says you can cut tax rates a lot of people from going down. Those who did got digital money. They didn't get paper money. And then, of course, that means they can freeze it or impose negative interest rates. They did come up with a new 2,000 rupee note. You could exchange it. Guess what? This shows how idiotic this was. The new paper money they printed was the wrong size. It didn't fit in the ATMs. They had to go around and close every ATM in India and you know, re refit them so they could dispense these new notes. It's been a disaster. There have been money riots. People have been standing in line for days to do this exchange. Meanwhile, this is the most idiotic thing of all, Richie. It's a cash-based economy. It would be one thing if you did this in the U.S. or the U.K. I mean, you know, 80% of our transactions probably are digital, you know, debit cards, credit cards, direct pay, Apple, you know, iPhone, the rest. But India is actually a cash-based economy. Fishermen could not buy fuel uh, and bait for their boats, they, so they couldn't bring in a cash. Farmers could not get fuel for their uh, trucks, so they couldn't bring their their crops into town. The whole economy was shutting down. This is what happens. Sorry to interrupt you. Can I, can I throw a wacky theory in there, which you, can, which you can shoot down? Do you think, and I'm just going to tweet out that India story, which happened around about November 9th or 10th, if I remember. 8th or 9th or 10th. We, we mentioned it uh, briefly on the program. And the way we mentioned it was, we said, well, we wonder if that was an experiment in some way to see to gauge the reaction of people because I think when you were first on we talked very briefly about the cashless society agenda because ultimately these same elites Jim they, they want they want rid of cash don't they well that's absolutely right we're seeing it in other countries you're exactly right Richie first of all um, about a year ago the European Central Bank banned the 500 euro note there used to be a 500 euro note that's now illegal going forward so the biggest one is a 200 euro note in the US uh, Larry Summers a professor at Harvard Ken Rogoff another professor at Harvard uh, Summers wants to ban the $100 bill uh, Rogoff wants to get rid of cash completely Sweden is well down the road to a cashless society more and more merchants are saying we don't take cash even if it's legal we don't take it by the way um, I'm sure it's similar in the UK uh, Americans think they can go get their cash out of the bank don't even try it you go up and ask for you know two or three thousand dollars not a you know particularly huge amount of money they'll call the manager over the teller's face will turn white they'll file a report uh, with what we call the financial crimes enforcement network that report will go into a file somewhere between Osama bin Laden and Pablo Escobar I mean you're treated like a criminal a perfectly honest citizen they'll treat you like a terrorist a drug dealer or a tax evader for asking for your own money cash. Jim for saying I want your, my own money for your own money exactly right so there's a global war on cash now I also said Richie I don't don't recall if we said it on the show the last time, but it's in my book. The war on cash leads very quickly to the war on gold because gold is an alternative. So if you're making money impossible to get, you know, I said, if you want to slaughter cattle, first thing you have to do is round them up into a pen. So if the elites want to slaughter savers, they have to round them up into these digital pens, the big banks, digital accounts, no paper, cashless society, round everybody and actually collect more revenue because you'll get more growth, uh, people sell assets, uh, you know, you'll get more activity. And so the revenue you get from the added activity makes up for the tax cuts. Uh, so that's the theory. The problem is there's almost no evidence to support the theory. It might be true at 100 percent. If you had 100 percent tax rates, nobody would work, right? So cut them a little bit, you get a little bit of work. But nobody really knows the shape of the Laffer curve. The evidence that it works 
uh, in the environment we're in today is is non-existent. So you're going to cut rates. You're going to get less revenue. So the wealthy will get a benefit from the lower tax rates. The economy will not get that much of a boost. We're eight years into an expansion. It's one thing at the early stage of an expansion. You do something like that. You might get a little more growth. You might get some bang for the buck. This this expansion is eight years old. Now, it's been punk. I mean, it's been a very weak expansion. I'll grant that. Not not as not much growth as we need. But you're not going to get much bang for the buck. So this kind of looks like uh, just a benefit for the rich in the sense that they get lower rates. You're not going to make it up in revenue because the, the Laffer curve doesn't work, work the way the theory says. And you're not even going to get that much growth because – we're eight years into this. We don't have that much spare capacity. So a lot of this doesn't add up. If you want to help the working man, cut the Social Security tax. The Social Security tax is a flat rate. Everybody pays it. I said before that not everybody pays income tax, and that's true in the United States. But everybody does pay the Social Security tax. That's a flat rate. If you really want to help people on lower incomes, you cut that tax. But I don't see that on the table. That's not part of these proposals. No, no. I'm going to mention again road to ruin dot London. That's where you can uh, get Jim's book, uh, The Road to Ruin. Now, um, sometimes we come across people who talk about finance and they make statements. And we don't invite them on programs like this because their statements are sensational and they are not backed up by, by fact. It's like the headline, not supported by the text. That is not the case um, with uh, Jim Rickards. He wouldn't be on otherwise. Jim, what is the financial elite's uh, ICE 9 plan. What is that? How do they plan to basically stop people using uh, and spending their own money? This is deadly serious stuff. How how are they doing that? Well, first of all, thank you, Richie. By, by the way, I, I don't make any claims that are not backed up. My book, The Road to Ruin, has 151 end notes. Now, fortunately, they're at the back. You don't have to read them if you, if you don't want to. But if you want to read them, if you want to explore the sources and the original documents, it's all there. So as I say, you can, you can debate the sources, but the, the claims are all backed up. Now, ICE-9 uh, is a concept I talk about in the book. Uh, it's borrowed from Kurt Vonnegut, the author. He wrote a novel in the early 60s, 1960s, called Cat's Cradle. And it, the plot involved a uh, sort of a mad scientist who invented this new molecule he called ICE-9. And it's just like water except for two things. Number one, the melting point is 114 degrees Fahrenheit, which means it's frozen at room temperature. The second thing is that when ice nine comes in contact with a regular molecule of water, it turns the water into ice nine. So in other words, it freezes. So the plot of the book was, you know, he kept in these vials and gave it to his kids. And if the children opened the vials and poured it into a stream, the stream, the river, the oceans, all the water on Earth would freeze, the planet would freeze, and life on Earth would die. So it was a kind of a doomsday machine. I've taken that story, great, great story, by the way, and I brought it in as a metaphor to describe what's going to happen in the financial markets in the next financial crisis. And I talk about two other crises, 1998 and 2008. Now, in both of those panics, 1998, there was a global financial panic. They printed the money and gave you your money back. In 2008, global financial panic. Again, central banks printed trillions of dollars. People were able to get some liquidity. In the next crisis, it's going to be bigger than the central banks. The central banks are not going to be able to bail it out because this crisis will be bigger than their capacity to do so. So where is the liquidity going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the International Monetary Fund with this world money they have. It's a funny name. It's called the Special Drawing Right or SDR. But that's going to take three or six or eight months to actually do. You've got to go all the countries in the world together. They've got to agree, come up with a plan. That's going to take a while to do. In the meantime, there's going to be a financial panic. It's going to be bigger than the central banks. It's going to take six months or longer for the IMF to ride to the rescue. They're going to lock down the system. They're going to freeze the system. Money market funds will not give you your money back. Banks will be closed. ATMs will be reprogrammed. Maybe they'll give you, say, 300 pounds a day for gas and groceries, maybe less, but they'll say, why do you need more than that? So you've got you know, 50,000 pounds in the bank. They'll say, sorry, you can only have you know, 300 pounds a day for gas and groceries. We'll get back to you about the rest. Banks will be closed. Exchanges will be closed. A couple of things. First of all, this has all happened before. Everything I just described has happened. You know, in 1933, uh, President Roosevelt closed every bank in America. 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Uh, as recently as 2015, ATMs and banks were taken offline in Greece. By the way, Richie, this is happening in India today. I finished uh, this book, The Road to Ruin. I finished writing it um, in early September. And, you know, it takes a couple months to bind it and put it in boxes and ship it out to the bookstores and all that. I could see all this was coming. I didn't know it would be here when the book came out. But yeah. it's in India today. They've, they've actually – imagine waking up tomorrow morning and Prime Minister May has said – uh, all uh, ten, five, ten, and twenty-pound notes are illegal. They're no longer le legal tender. 
That's what happened in India. Prime Minister Modi woke up and said the 1,000 rupee note and the 500 rupee note are illegal. They are no longer money. By the way, 1,000 rupees is, is about, uh, about 15, 20 pounds, so it's, it's comparable. So, uh, so they said, well, what you can do, it's illegal, you can't spend it, but you can bring it down to the bank and deposit it. We'll give you digital credit in your account. Oh, by the way, the tax man was waiting at the counter. If you walked in with a large pile of notes, say, well, here, here are my old notes. I'd like to get these digital credits. They'll say, well, where did you get the money? So the tax inspectors are there. This is the up. And then you can slaughter them with negative interest rates, confiscation, taxes, account freezes, etc. So, well, cash is an alternative to that, but they're making cash illegal or extremely difficult to get. But you can still get gold. It's legal. I'm talking about physical gold, not paper gold. Physical gold, whether it's you know coins, uh, sovereigns, or our American gold eagles, or, or other other forms, you can put those in a safe place, not in the banking system, by the way, because the, the day you most want your gold is the day the banks are going to be closed. So that's what we call conditional correlation. Those two things will happen together. You'll want your gold to be banging on the door of the bank. They won't let you in. But there are non-banks, uh, places I'm not, uh, not an endorsement, but I know Sharps Pixley down at uh, German Street in London, and there are other places around the UK, reputable dealers, private vaults, you can store it safely. But but the elites are going to wake up to this. They're going to say, hey, we, we boxed everybody in. We, we made it impossible to get cash. We put them into these digital uh, slaughterhouses so we can take their money digitally. But people have gone to gold. Well, guess what they're doing in India right now? I just read this this morning. The tax police are breaking down doors and they're seizing gold, physical gold, just taking it. You know, As you know, an Indian bride, that's her dowry. Uh, if you had too much of it, they seem to think you're a criminal and they're taking that. So the war on gold is right behind the war on cash. My advice, get your gold now while you still can. This is an amazing stuff, uh, by the way. Folks, then we've got Jim Rickards on uh, the line. We're talking about uh, his brand new book, The Road to Ruin. Um, we've tweeted out, uh, road to ruin dot... Um, let me just... Uh, Make double sure of that now. Yes, I have put the right one out. The road to ruin dot London. That's where you can get the book for free, folks. Okay, the secret plan for the next financial crisis. Jim, uh, the tweets are flying in. Uh, they are flying in. Is it fair to say that the these financial crises, crises plural, um, are all connected, and that what happened in uh, two thousand and eight again was an experiment and was the pretext for what's going to happen next? Well, they are definitely connected in the same way that uh, you'll see earthquakes in the same place over and over. And that's not just a metaphor, Richie. I mean, it's a, you know, maybe an interesting metaphor, but this, the dynamics, the, the systemic dynamics, the math and the physics are exactly the same. So if I'm standing in Florida and you say to me, Jim, when's the next earthquake? I'll say, probably never. Florida's not seismically active. There are no fault lines in Florida. You don't get earthquakes in Florida. But if we're standing out in the San Andreas Fault in the California desert, or in Sumatra, um, that I'll say it could happen any minute. It could be the biggest earthquake you've ever seen. So we we have these indications. We know they're coming. The financial system is no different. It's a complex dynamic system. It's capable of collapse at any time. Now here's the difference. If an earthquake starts, you can't stop it. An, an earthquake is a release of energy. That's what an earthquake is. That's how they're defined. Uh, you can't stop it. But imagine if you could. Imagine a thought experiment. You could stop an earthquake in the middle of its activity. What would happen? All that would happen is the energy would be stored up. It would be waiting for the next time. It wouldn't be released, and the next earthquake would be worse. 